Hey guys, uh, good evening. Um, thank you for joining. Um, as I said, I'm Bjorn Obermeier. Um, I'm responsible for uh, Web3 blockchain and digital ownership at Accenture Innovation. Um, as I said, uh, I'm from Germany. Yeah, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Giuseppe Giordano. I'm based in Italy, in Milan, and uh, I lead uh, a new uh, set of offerings that we are starting at Accenture that we call uh, Trusted Data Services that includes all technologies to increase the level of trust for data that will be used by AI. And in particular, I focus on things like uh, confidential computing, synthetic data, knowledge graphs, all things that uh, we need uh, to increase the level of trust when we deal with AI. Thank you. So, um, I wanted to start giving or addressing a little bit uh, data privacy in today's digital age. And by doing that, um, I want to start with a definition. So data privacy refers to the protection of personal data that is collected, stored, and um, processed by individuals, organizations, and governments. It uh, is about the rights of an individual to control their own data and ensuring that, 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 that this data is handled uh, securely, ethically, and within um, the applicable laws and regulations. Data privacy includes as well um, the processes and tools um, to prevent unauthorized access to that information, um, prevent misuse and any, dis any disclosure of that um, sensitive information, thereby fostering trust and confidence. Now, I spoke about protection of personal data. So what's personal data actually? Yet another definition. Personal data refers to any information that relates to an identified or an identifiable individual. So what is an identified individual? An identified individual is basically or refers to, an, to a person whose identity is known, right? For data context, it's you know, something like where my name is actually written. So we've seen it on the overview slide of the two of us. There was the name, the picture, our titles, and our... Um, um, our employer, so identified individual. An identifiable individual is basically um, refers to a person where the name is not provided, for instance, or basically where information is provided where you can deduce or infer to come up and understand who that individual may be. As an example, if I showed you my overview slides without my name, just my title, just my employer and the picture, I'm pretty sure by Googling you can find out what my name is. Hence, it is personal information because it can link back to who I am. So it's all part of personal data and personal information. But there's more information, there's more details that can be used in order to link who I am and, and thus be impersonal. Names, context information, uh, it may be the mobile phone number, um, probably a very good unique identifier of everybody. Um, location data, um, online identifiers, and I'm pretty sure we have a lot of online identifiers. Um, I don't know about you, but I have really a lot. And um, it can as well encompass the characteristics and behaviors that make you you. It includes biometrics, it could be your picture, and there's a lot of companies out there that actually day in, day out profile you, right? So they want to understand who you are, they're taking all these data to make a picture, sorry, to make a profile to understand who you are. And Linking all this data together, you know, basically suffices to identify you as a specific individual. So that's all part of personal data. And um, I want to put an emphasis that data privacy is not an option. It's a fundamental human right. Um, we see that as well in legislation, and I'll come to that in a, in a short second. But again, it's a fundamental human right. And I think in our digital society that we have become, and it's getting more and more digital, we need to be cognizant about keeping our data safe, and there's technology to do that. Again, it's a fundamental right, and uh, we need to act upon it. So I want to speak briefly about where is personal data actually currently used. And um, this is a little bit of a historic right as well. If you look at the top row here, um, like 20 years ago, probably, most data was stored and generated on your laptops or desktop computers. It was personal to you, only you were probably using it because there was not such a thing like, well, 20 years ago, there was some cloud, but it was generally sitting on your, on your laptop and desktop. 
Then you had other data, like with financial institutions, you know, where they have your name, your address, your credit score, your banking details, the, the, the amount of money that you store there. So a lot of stuff to actually profile you, something that they have to safe keep. There's medical records, for instance, healthcare providers, right? Um, you go there, they have, again, address, they have your MRI images, they have your biometrics, your blood. So there's a lot of stuff, a lot of personal data that they keep. And there's probably a lot of other examples as well of, um, of institutions that you interfere, insurance, they have all your data, right? And now we see in, in our current digital age, um, of course, you know, we have IoT devices, like smartwatches, rings, wristbands, you know, there's a lot of stuff actually generating data that can be directly linked to you, right? Um, sometimes we share them for convenience, just to get something back in return, because you know, and guilty as charged. Um, I just say, well, here's my data, do something, I'm getting a cool, cool, cool thing back, and it's like, okay, that's nice. I just share it, but it is all personal data, and I don't know really what's done with it. I just hope it's, it's done uh, faithfully. Then our digital companion in our pockets, the mobile phones, right? I don't know how much data it's actually holding, but it's a lot. Um, it's super personal. I have it at me all the times. I generate a lot of all the pictures, all the places you can check in. There's a location everywhere. So this device is actually generating a lot of personal data. And then, of course, we have the cloud. So any services that you use, any, any online services, basically, there's a lot where you use the cloud. You have social accounts. If you do collaboration, um, if you work, basically we use the cloud to share data um, and um, to collaborate together. Now, what's the importance actually in this uh, uh, today's digital age and as we've become a more and more and more digital society? So there's increased data generation. Um, so there's over 2.4 quintillion bytes of data created. Um, for those who are currently calculating, it's 2,400 petabytes. And for those who doesn't, uh, don't understand what it is, it's really a lot. Really a lot of data. Every day generated um, through our phones, through you know, all the technical devices that we use. And there's a lot of personal information that is constantly shared by all of our applications, social, you know, all that stuff. Um, willingness or unwillingness, we share a lot of personal information. There's growing cyber threats in our digital society. And I keep saying that again. Um, data is the fuel that runs that society. Everybody wants to kind of get access to our data. They use it to profile us. They use it to give us customized services. So there's, of course, an interest on either side, like, you know, to, to get hold of that data. So there's a growing threat on cyber attacks. And um, businesses face real issues. Um, if, you, if you open up Google, just type in data breach, Pretty sure you find something where like, oh, credit card data was stolen here, health records were stolen here, these accounts were compromised, that. So there's a lot of your personal stuff just going out into the wild. There's consumer trust issues. Um, so data privacy is critical um, to building really um, and maintaining trust between me and whoever I interact with. Um, I think 70% of consumers, that's what a study says, um, are more likely to engage with brands that promote and prioritize data protection. Um, I'm one of these 70 percent because I do know um, for those who have a password manager, um, there are some sophisticated password managers out there. They show you sometimes if any of your passwords have been breached. Um, they even, you know, search the dark web and they show you, oh, passwords have been breached here. Um, I've seen some, some, uh, some companies where I have online accounts where it's like, oh, I thought they were actually having a lot of stuff in IT to protect my stuff. I was surprised, apparently, they didn't. So uh, I'm choosing, I'm doing my research, I'm getting more and more a little bit security paranoid because it's my data and there is means to protect that data. Regulatory compliance, um, stringent laws um, are around. Um, so we have GDPR, um, then the CCPA like in California, um, stipulating um, to have robust data protection measures. Um, Non-compliance uh, will lead to hefty fines. Uh, I think it's like 4% of the annual turnover that one can be fined. Um, and it's, it's actually a big deal. So companies have to have an interest to keep your personal data safe. That includes as well things like the right to be forgotten. So if you do want to have your data a, uh, show it, you know, what they do with your data. And if you want to get it removed, they have to do it. And then there's empowerment and control. Um, I think individuals are increasingly demanding to have control over, over your own data, right? and understanding who is doing what with your personal information. 
I, for one, want to know why somebody is requesting my personal information right now. I barely understand who's actually accessing my stuff. If somebody's doing a background check, I would never know. If somebody's trying to understand my, um, my credit score, I would never know. Nobody would ever tell me because that data sits somewhere. I don't know exactly where it is. So um, that's, uh, that's definitely an issue. And now if you think of all of that, just add AIDAS, wallets, and AI on top. So AIDAS is a regulatory standard from the EU for all European member states. Um, it is the regulation on electronic identification and uh, trust services, basically stipulating that you have an um, EID um, that you can use cross-border within the EU, so like you know, your card on the phone, and then that you have trust services for authenticity of transactions. So that's coming, that's gonna be enforced in two years. Um, it will be applicable for all member states and will be available for uh, all 400 million citizens of the European Union, addressing some of the privacy concerns. There's digital wallets. I suppose many of you use wallets, um, and I'm not only speaking about the Apple wallet or the Google wallet, there's you know, way, way, way more wallets that you can do financial transactions, um, money, objects, store NFTs, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of wallets out there in part as a reaction to the data privacy issues and uh, being as well enforced by the IDAS regulation. Um, it's empowering us as users to give us control back over our own, over own data so we can confidently share and understand who's actually requesting information and be able to selectively disclose information. Like I maybe want, only want to share my date of birth, right? If I enter somewhere, like in a, in a, in a, in a, in a bar, um, but I don't, they don't need to know my address, right? So I just want to selectively share attributes of my identity that I want to, uh, want to share, and I want to control for how long I share this. And then there is AI. Without an AI slide, I guess um, I couldn't do that presentation this age. Um, AI is on the rise. Um, most applications these days have an AI element. So they may have a companion. They may you know, be uh, embedded into, into the mobile application um, in order to automate some tasks and to make it really relevant for you. And to make it relevant, the best possible data that can, can be fed is your personal information, right? So then it's super relevant because it understands who you are. And based on that, it can give you something relevant. Putting this all together, like in summary, right now what we have, we have modern devices, like real powerful mobile phones. There's a lot of compute. There's a lot of security built in. We can use biometrics on our phones, face ID, um, touch ID, all that kind of stuff to authenticate applications, access to our services, really powerful, really cool, and super convenient, right? And super secure. We have AI on the edge, meaning we have these applications so they can do processing on the edge. On the edge means like on a mobile device. It can use my data that's sitting on the device without compromising any of the confidentiality on that device. Super cool. We have tokenization providing us ownership. Tokenization as in like a digital identity, um, tokens for money transactions, NFTs, if you will. Um, there's many forms of tokenization, so we can put them in a wallet, we can control it, we can share it, and we can remove the sharing as well. We have digital wallets, the means to control it, which is going to be the key engagement platform going forward. A lot of people would like to get things in a wallet, on a phone, and companies want to access that as well. And then, lastly, we have secure hardware in our phones, like a secure enclave on iOS or a trust box, I think, on, uh, on, on Android, that's storing our crypto material and the keys to actually manage um, the entire personal data that's sitting on, on the phone. Very powerful. This is what we have right now. I want to give one last example to put a little bit more color to it. Like every, every year around Christmas, and some of you may know that, um, we always have to you know, build up this calendar of like, all the pictures from the entire year for you know, all the parents. I can do that easily on my phone, right? I have everything, all the pictures sitting there, everything is face tagged, right? I have AI apps and all that kind of stuff that create me a beautiful calendar, perfect. No compromise of my data whatsoever. But what about if I have to combine that with other people, right? How do I collaborate without having actually all this data leaving from my phone? And what is the, qu the question is, how do I actually compute outside of my personal phone? So we may need to have something else, some confidential compute, that is not on the phone, but on the cloud, because on the phone it already works. And with that, I want to hand over to Giuseppe to speak about confidential compute um, in the cloud. Yes, thank you, Bjorn. 
So, um, to, to continue a bit with the analogy of, of the mobile phone, um, what I'll be talking about here is uh, confidential computing as a way to protect the sensitive information the moment that this information leaves the phone, right? So, as long as the information is on my phone, especially the ones that have a secure enclave, I have some confidence on the fact that the data is on the phone, it doesn't leave the phone, it's in my control, and there is some secure hardware on the phone to manage my keys, my passwords, my, my biometrics for face ID, and so on and so forth. And this also starts from the assumption that as of today, since those, powerful are, those phones are extremely powerful, we can run a lot of algorithms, including AI on these phones. Uh, Small language models is the big thing today. And uh, those phones can run small models, but also models that are large enough. But given the trend that we are seeing, at some point from the phone, we'll, we will want to interact with some large models that eventually are hosted in the cloud. And the question is, do I need to give away my private information the moment I want to use some of those services in the cloud? Can I keep protecting my data the same way I do on the phone while they are processed in the cloud. And this is why we are looking at confidential computing as a way to use some secure hardware, trusted execution environments in the cloud to make sure that while the data is processed, it's actually protected while in use. And confidential computing is not the only technology for doing that. So really look at confidential computing as one of those privacy-enhancing te privacy technologies is probably the most mature out in the market, but there are also some others, things like uh, secure multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption, and uh, differential privacy. We heard the talk this morning from my colleague Luigi, and so on and so forth. So what is confidential computing before we look at the use cases for the cloud? So confidential computing, it's all about protecting the data while in use, using uh, an hardware-based, attested, trusted execution environment. One of the examples probably that you've heard of is uh, this concept of Intel SGX, these secure enclaves. Basically, what a secure enclave is, is a portion of the memory of the CPU which is encrypted in an hardware-protected fashion. It basically means that you can load in those secure enclaves some encrypted data, and that's the only place where the encrypted data can be dealt with. In that secure enclave, the actual data gets decrypted, but it's an hardware environment where you have some guarantees that you can attest on the fact that the data is decrypted and only processed in that specific portion of the memory, and it doesn't give any authorization, any access to unauthorized processes and users. So to do confidential computing properly, as defined by the Confidential Computing Consortium, we need dedicated hardware. What we can do with, the, with, the, with confidential computing is isolate workloads, data and algorithms. Of course, we can use this to protect the data, but not only, we can also protect the algorithm. If we look at our phones, I'm pretty sure that especially on the Apple ones, um, on the secure enclave, there are also some algorithms that are proprietary to Apple that are running in that secure enclave because they want to keep the IP. And it's not only about my data, but it's also about them protecting their algorithm that runs on my phone. Then you can encrypt and control basically what's going on. Because every time you upload something into a confidential computing environment, you're actually encrypting the data. And of course, you have to have a protocol to exchange the keys. And you can verify what happens. And verify, it's not, about, it's not just about verifying the security of the infrastructure and the hardware, but it's also about the integrity of the algorithm. So am I sure that it's the algorithm that is supposed to be, deal with, be dealing with my data, that the one that is running in the secure enclave? So it's not just about security of the environment, but it's also about the integrity of the software stack that deals with my data. This can help with many things, right? As I said, we can, this can help with protecting my sensitive data. It can help with um, protecting the IP of the algorithms that get deployed in those spaces. Definitely from a regulation standpoint, IPA, GDPR, DORA, this helps with privacy and compliance. And then, especially these days in Europe, there is this big trend of data sovereignty and control. This also helps you um, have guarantees on the fact that the data not only stay in the nation within the boundaries of your country, but also are processed in an environment that you know you can attest and you can verify later. And in terms of applications, before double-clicking on some of those, when you deal with confidential computing, you normally have three types of applications. 
you have single organizations that are migrating to the cloud. I have some workloads on-prem. For some reasons, I need the GPU on Azure, on GCP, on AWS. And uh, while I migrate to the cloud to go there and fine-tune my model with these GPUs, I want to protect my model and the data. I, don't want, I want to make sure that Microsoft, Azure, Google cannot see my workloads. And now you can actually use confidential computing to move your encrypted workload to the cloud, to use GPU in a way that you can isolate those workloads and the infrastructure provider and any unauthorized users cannot access your workload. That's the first one and the one that we are seeing getting a lot of traction, especially with data sovereignty here in Europe. Then you have the multi-party use cases, a bit like federated learning. There was a talk uh, about this morning. Uh, the difference is that with federated learning, you keep the data at the edge. With this, you centralize the data in a secure environment, in an encrypted environment, so that you can eventually train a model together across organizations, making sure that each of the organizations cannot see the data that the others are contributing. And then the output is a much more precise model because you've been training on data coming from multiple sources while protecting them. And then what I'm going to double click here is all the use cases around confidential AI and, and the kind of things that you can do now with AI uh, while protecting the uh, private information as well as the IP and the ownership of the models. Um, when it comes to confidential AI, you have different ways of using confidential computing. In this slide, you, you see four, uh, right? Um, and it all deals with the trust model that you want to put in place and what you want to protect and who are the actors. And you can use it for training as well as for inference. It really depends on what you want to protect. In the first case on the left, you are protecting the query and the response. Basically, you have a model provider that deploys the model into a trusted execution environment and it makes it available for model inference. Now I am a user, I want to use that model I can make sure that if the model runs in a trusted execution environment, the model owner doesn't have to see my data. If that model is deployed in a trusted execution environment, I can encrypt my query, my prompt, send it to the model that runs in a secure enclave. This is where the inference is going to happen, and I get back a response which is encrypted, and I am the only one who can decrypt and see the result. In this way, what you are doing, the model provider is kind of protecting the model because it's in the cloud, maybe, in a trusted execution environment. And myself, as a user, I can protect my prompt in a way that the model provider nor the cloud infrastructure provider can see what I'm asking that model for. That's the first modality, inference, pure inference. The one in the middle, it's about protecting the data. For example, if multiple organizations want to fine-tune or train a model together. A group of hospitals, for example, who want to train a model for uh, drug discovery, illness detection, each of those hospitals can encrypt their data sets, each of them managing their own keys. All these data get uh, loaded into a trusted execution environment. All the data get aggregated, assuming that we have standardized the way we want our data to be. Once all the, the, the data are in, uh, they can get aggregated, we fine-tune the model, and we give back the model to all the organizations that have contributed the model, uh, have contributed data, sorry. So what I'm protecting here is the individual contributions from all the hospitals in this case, from all the data providers, and uh, the incentive for them is I do this, I make my data available without giving them away because I'm still protecting, and I get back a model which is uh, better trained. And then the other one on, on the right is the typical example that you can use in the cloud, but also at the edge. So you have a model provider that wants to protect their model and needs to ship that model towards an infrastructure, towards the edge, which is a place that they don't control. So I have a model, I want to run it on your premise, and I want to make sure that I don't lose control of the model and you cannot see the model, but you can use it. In this way, you can have uh, basically a secure enclave running uh, in your environment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encrypt the model, ship it to your environment. The model is going to be available in your environment in a way that in your environment, you can use my model without being able to see the model. And you are also protecting the confidentiality of your information because your information stays local and doesn't leave. 
So this is interesting because on one side, myself as a user, I'm not concerned about my data leaving. I don't have to encrypt because everything happens locally on my server or my phone. And you, you can monetize the model, shipping it around while protecting the model. So these are the three modalities, classic ones on how to use confidential computing for um, inference as well as training. And these are the three uh, patterns that we've seen in the cloud. And then there is the one on the bottom, that gateway for LLMs, which is what we are seeing a lot for, um, basically for uh, interactions with third party LLMs. So today I need to interact with, uh, for some reasons, with uh, ChatGPT or any of the third party models out there. The risk is that when I submit um, my prompt, in the prompt there are some sensitive information, some PII that you don't want to give away. But at the same time, you want the model to generate some text for you. And basically what you can do is you can have an agent that we call gateway that sits in between yourself and the model in a way that your prompt can be sanitized in that agent in a way that you send to the model only what you are supposed to send, potentially a tokenized or sanitized prompt. The model can do the job and you get back the information desanitized knowing that this transformation is happening in a secure enclave so that if that service is offered by a third party, that third party can offer the service without seeing your prompting clear, nor the service provider, nor the model owner. And basically in, the, in these two slides, I'm uh, re-elaborating a little bit on this. So I think uh, for what we've discussed with Bjorn, and especially if we keep uh, the example of the phone, this is one which is very relevant. It's the one where I said the model gets indeed um, deployed in a trusted execution environment. The query and the response are encrypted. The user keeps the keys in a way that you can encrypt your query and you, you are the only one who can decrypt the result. Um, and then what's interesting is uh, this concept of um, the, the third party model that is used. Um, at Accenture, we work with, uh, with a company called Opaque. They are in California. They deal with the, they built a confidential AI platform. They can help with inference training, uh, multi-party clean rooms or confidential workspaces, but they also have this concept of agent, which is that uh, uh, purple uh, gateway that you see sitting in between the LLM application and the, the LLM model. And basically the way it works is a bit how uh, I described it earlier, right? So you have Tracy Garcia uh, that for some reasons need uh, to send a prompt to a third party model. So that's the prompt and how the prompt looks like. You see that in the prompt there is some PII, name, family name, account number. Together with the prompt you have some context that also has some private information. Uh, account number again, address and so on and so forth. And this is what you are going to uh, submit or you want to submit to, um, to an LLM, which is open. It's, in, it's out there in the public. Basically, what you can do with these kind of solutions is uh, you can uh, encrypt uh, the context and the prompt keeping your keys. This information gets into a trusted execution environment where uh, that AI agent is actually running and with some transformation, in the confidential computing environment, you are basically going to tokenize or sanitize the prompt and the context in a way that it's going to look like this. The name, Tracy Garcia, becomes person one, address one, and so on and so forth. Of course, this is an example. This can get much more complex. You can get with documents that you are doing OCR on. You can do an LP, build your own logic to, to describe the ontology and really understand what's confidential for that specific use case and so on and so forth. But once you've sanitized and you are happy with the level of privacy that you've achieved with your prompt and context, basically this information, completely anonymized, can be sent to, uh, to the model. The model is going to do the work and of course this works for all the use cases where the model doesn't have to have the PII but can generate some text, can give you the information depending on the context that you are submitting and the model is going to give a recommendation on the type of investment that this person should be doing depending on the context that has provided without having to know that that person is Tracy Garcia. It can work with person one. The, sanit the, the sanitized uh, answer from the model comes back into the trusted execution environment. 
In the trusted execution environment, you've kept a session that says that that token corresponds for that specific user to a specific PII. You desanitize your prompt, you encrypt it with the key that the user has provided, and then you send it back. And this is where you have the guarantee that only the user will be able to decrypt that information and go back to the original prompt that has the PII. Of course, this is quite simplistic. That's it. That is an agent that in this case has just done a simple text tokenization or sanitization, but in that agent you can imagine be doing much more complex things up to be doing some rag and so on that you can run in a confidential virtual machine, right? Um, so that, um, that gateway, that agent can be as complex as you want, basically, as long as you run in a trusted execution environment. And what I forgot to say at the beginning is that um, the SGX is something that uh, gives you some limitations in terms of memory and complexity and also the type of algorithms that you can run in the secure enclave. But nowadays, if you look at uh, Azure, GCP, AWS and so on, they are all offering what we call confidential virtual machines, right? So in the past, it was all about an enclave, a dedicated portion of the memory. Now you can actually provision on Azure, for example, a confidential VM which is fully encrypted. And the moment you have a confidential VM, the complexity of the application that you can deploy in the trusted execution environment has pretty much no limits. And you can also start imagining using some confidential containers that you orchestrate with some sort of confidential Kubernetes in a way that your different agents run into dedicated containers and each of those containers can also be attested in order for you to have the guarantees of the type of algorithms that run and deal with your data. So to conclude and leave some time call for questions, for trusted AI, we, needed, we need some trusted data and that definitely includes the ability to protect the confidentiality of the sensitive data. And we strongly believe that confidential computing is not the only tool, is one of the tools that will help us protect the information, especially when leaving the devices that we own and control ourselves, maybe um, being, uh, being used in the cloud. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>